ever heard of the sickle cell disease, a blood disorder that is passed from parents who are carriers to their offspring. And there are situations whereby people just get married without knowing their genotype. And this, in the long run, affects their children. Hello, Saints. This is Kakli Faith Forum. I'm Evelyn Iwoha. And today, our topic of discussion is genotype and marriage. When we return from this short break, we will know who our guest will be on this discussion. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is Kakli Faith Forum. I'm Evelyn Iwoha, and our topic of discussion today is genotype and marriage. Allow me to introduce to you Fra J, mm -hmm. my very good friend, yes, and sir. Dr. Ade Damola Adeogun. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Evelyn. It's How are you here. doing today? I'm doing good. I hope you're feeling really good. Doing great, too. Thank you. Ade, don't yeah. be, Ade, Ade, doctor, don't be intimidated <laughs> by me. <laughs> 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 That's amazing. So just before we get to it, I have heard stories of men and women who decide to settle down together and they do not pay so much consideration to their genotype. Yeah. They just feel that they're in love and, you know, because they are in love, they want to go for what they want. Mm -hmm. And when they go for what they want, at the later end of everything, they discover that their children suffer for their um, negligence to genotype. So how important is genotype to marriage? So for me, I just say quickly, um, people say love conquers all, but I don't think that's true. Well, I also agree that you have to count the costs before you get into anything or make any decision. Padre, you say love conquers all. That's what they say. That's oh. what I said. Thus, love conquer all. Love doesn't conquer all. That's what I'm trying okay, to say. That people say, say that. Um, and often they, they say it in the sense of, oh, um, oh, maybe you tell them. Have you considered your genotype? And I tell you, Alpha, don't worry, Father, everything will be all right. We love each other. We would be able to wade through all of those discussions with that. So I don't think that is always the case. I think okay. people need to be a little more intentional whenever they find themselves in situations involving things as difficult or as um, sensitive as life, yes, yes, life. Uh, so that they don't get into any situation where they start saying, why did I even get into this in the first place? How can one know their genotype? Uh, well, genotype is something that you can know, you know, via a simple blood test at the hospital. And it is one of the most important premarital steps that you need to take. Because um, there's something referred to as genetic counseling, whereby intending couples, you know, come for counseling and then you prepare them well ahead of marriage, telling them, you know, your union has consequences mm -hmm. and you're going to raise children. So your decision must also involve the well-being of your unborn children. I have to be sure that the children you're bringing into this world are going to be healthy and they're going to be productive. So um, people come to the hospital, a simple blood test is done, yeah. and then you know where they belong in terms of the genotypes. We have, the different, we have different types. Okay. You know, depending on um, the genetics of the family, where the individual comes from. And... You know, for instance, I'm sure everybody is aware that when two people with the S in the genotype yeah. come together, there's a 25% chance that they're going to have a child who exactly. is going to have that condition. And I think personally that the worst thing any parent can experience is watching their loved ones in pain or having to die. So uh, it's like Friar Jay said, it's important to look ahead and make the right decision right from the beginning without um, putting yourself into unnecessary pain in the future. I think part of the problem, when you mentioned 25%, people are mm -hmm. not looking at the 25, they're looking at the 75. They're saying, oh, there's a 75 possibility, 75 possibility of getting a normal child. A so why would, child. I, why would I want to give up on this love because of only 25%? That only 25% that ends up yes, not being only. Exactly. The the and then some people are so, they are so deep in the faith. They really believe that God will change things. They really believe, they are so positive that no matter how much you counsel them, you tell them this and this, these are the pros, these are the cons, this is what you need to consider before you get into marriage. This is what is possible at the end of the day. And given that the 25% and they just focus more on the 75 I think the problem is not really them believing God that things are going to be well. They are, I think they are using God because God who 
created us, has created us with intelligence exactly. to be able to find out these factors. Yeah, we have a choice. So you already know what God is saying to you. Yes. But you are choosing to set that aside in order to use God to achieve your own personal aim, which is which brings us back to what you started with. That whole idea of love. People think they're in love and that love can change every situation in their life. That's not always the case. Love has to have some sense. So can we say that there is a particular, um, there's, a, there's a chosen or a, the best genotype to actually consider when settling or getting married? Is there a, the best genotype or is there, is there a particular one you say this is the best? The genotype is attributable to um, hemoglobin, okay. you know. So when you have hemoglobin A, you have hemoglobin S, you have the hemoglobin C, you know. So when somebody is AS, it means it has both A and S. S hemoglobin types. Mm-hmm. So usually if you have an AA, then that means that you are, you are good to go. But when you have an S or a C, those are the ones that are the mutated forms that carry the sickle cell traits, as we mm-hmm. call it. So somebody with an AS is called a carrier, a carrier. Or, or somebody living with the traits. But if the person gets married to another spouse who is also a, a carrier, carrier, then they now have children that suffer from that. So basically, from my experience, I've, I can tell you for, for sure that it is not a pleasant experience. Watching somebody in sickle cell crisis is a very heartbreaking experience because the pain is beyond description. I've once asked the patient to just give me a glimpse of what the pain feels like. And the person said, and she's an adult, a woman, and she told me that the pain of labor is nothing compared to the pain of a crisis. That's why she would prefer to be in labor than to be in a sickle cell crisis. So that means the pain is excruciating. And you can imagine you watching your loved ones, you are in and out of the hospital, having to have blood transfusion from yes. time to time. Even delivery, when they get into adulthood and they get married too, for them to have a lady who is a sickle cell patient, for her to go through delivery, every pregnancy is a risk. So I think um, our viewers should learn from this that is important for you to count the cost and make an informed decision before making a vital decision like marriage. Let's take a break. Let's know who the sense of the week is. We'll be right back. Our saint of the week is Saint Charles Luanga of Uganda. In 1879, Catholicism began spreading in Uganda when the White Fathers, a congregation of priests founded by Cardinal Lavigeri, were peacefully received by King Mutesa of Uganda. The priests soon began preparing catechumens for baptism, and before long, a number of the young pages in the king's court had become Catholics. However, on the death of Mutesa, his son, Muwanga, a corrupt man who ritually engaged in pedophilic practices with the younger pages, took the throne. When King Muanga had a visiting Anglican bishop murdered, his chief page, Joseph Mukasa, a Catholic who went to great length to protect the younger boys from the king's lust, denounced the king's actions and was beheaded on November 15, 1885. The 25-year-old Charles Luanga, a man wholly dedicated to the Christian instruction of the younger boys, became the chief page and just as forcibly protected them from the king's advances. St. Charles Luanga was born in 1860 in the kingdom of Buganda in the southern part of modern Uganda. On the night of the martyrdom of Joseph Mukasa, realizing that their own lives were in danger, Luanga and some of the other pages went to the White Fathers to receive baptism. Another hundred catechumens were baptized in the week following Joseph Mukasa's death. The following May, King Muanga learned that one of the boys was learning catechism. He was furious and ordered all the pages to be questioned to separate the Christians from the others. The Christians, 15 in all, between the ages of 13 and 25, stepped forward. The king asked them if they were willing to keep their faith. And they answered in unison, until death. On June 3rd, 1886, the Feast of the Ascension, Charles Luanga was separated from the others and burned at the stake. The executioner slowly burned his feet until only the child remained. Still alive, they promised him that they would let him go if he renounced his faith. 
He refused, saying, You are burning me, but it is as if you are pouring water over my body. Hmm. He then continued to pray silently as they set him on fire. Now just before the flames reached his heart, he looked up and said in a loud voice, Katonda, meaning my God, and then he died. His companions were all burned together the same day, all the while praying and singing hymns until they died. Pope Paul VI canonized him and his companions in 1964. His feast day is on the 3rd of June. Saint Charles Luanga is the patron saint of African Catholic Youth Action. And so we say, Saint Charles Luanga, pray for us. Welcome back, and this is the Catholic Faith Forum. Our topic of discussion is genotype and marriage. Just before the break, Doctor, you established that it is important for people to count the cost of their decisions, most especially before settling down with a partner. And you also stated that AS um, spouse is a carrier of the sickle cell disease. And if that such a person happens to settle down with another carrier, there's a higher or 25% possibility that they will have a sickle cell child or prodigies. Now, why do you think people take that risk? Well, Aside from the fact that they love and, you know, they really want to go for what they want. What is that reason that might not be genuine enough for them to just leave out or be ne neglect what is most important, especially for the next generation? If you ask me my opinion, I think uh, Friar J has actually answered the question. I will put it simply, selfishness, simple as yes, that. Yes, absolutely, I agree. And then trying to put God into the picture mm -hmm. while it's your own decision. Sure. You did not make proper preparation and then you blame God at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Or you expect God to you know, change things and create a miracle where uh, you know, it was a problem that could have been prevented. Sure. I have watched movies and I've heard stories of them. Um, sickle cell individuals who at the end of the day, they, they begin to blame their parents that, why do you have me? Why did you take that risk? Why didn't you consider me? Why did you allow me pass through this pain? And they are unable, some of them actually are unable to socialize with other people. They feel like they are not capable, they're not up to the tax, and they suffer so much. Why some of them actually survive, they overcome that box, they, they actually come out of the box, and they, they show people that, yes, I have sickle cell disease, but I can perform just as a normal woman being can perform. What would be your advice to such individuals who find themselves in that situation or that circumstance? Well, just like Padre said, there's a bit of selfishness on the part of the parents. Then we should also look at the social factors um, responsible for how people perceive sickle cell patients because... I can tell you that until people are well orientated or well educated, they would see sickle cell patients as people that are not as healthy as other people. So in terms of employment, they don't get the best of jobs. In terms of marriage, I can imagine taking somebody who has that illness, you know, telling your parents that this is the person I want to get married to, everybody's going to be like, are you sure you're making the right decision? And you want to become so, a charity case. Exactly. So there are a lot of things, you know, to be considered. And they themselves are not allowed to participate in sports. They, they have aspirations, they have hobbies, yeah, things they true. enjoy, but they are limited. Yeah. Sure. Because yeah. everybody keeps thinking, are you sure you can cope with this? Are you sure, sure you're physically fit for exactly. this? So I, I really agree with you that some of them, they may start blaming their parents yeah. for taking um, the decision based on only themselves without taking a look at the big picture. But um, I would advise that people who live with that condition should make sure that they do the best they can to stay healthy, you know, go to the hospital frequently, have um, checks frequently. And there are some things we, we give to them. They're they are on a daily supplementation, malaria prevention, things to do to prevent malaria, stay hydrated, know their limits when it comes to stress management. Those are the things that usually tip them into a crisis. But Regardless of that, the condition is what it is. Yeah. So what we should be looking at is how to prevent it. Prevention, they say, is better than cure. Better than cure. Which is why many times the church will always advise them. It's not a restricting factor. Most, in most dioceses in Nigeria, people will not stop you from going on. If you say, I want to get married to this person, I want to get married, I'm convinced this is the person I want to get married. No one will stop mm -hmm. you. But you also have to advise yourself. You have to tell yourself, a little bit of hard truth. I love this person, I want to spend the rest of my life with this person, but is forever worth it? Yes. Is it really worth it? Because the marriage will be challenged. True. I tell people, if you're entering into any marriage, no matter if you, whether you have the best 
um, match, you would say, as a, as a male or female um, going into marriage, the marriage will always go through its own unique challenges. Mm -hmm. And it's good that you go into it with minimal baggage, as minimum as possible, so that you don't get into a situation where you now start saying, I knew, somehow in my mind, I knew this is not going to work out, but I eventually put exactly. myself into it. And I, I counsel a lot of people, and, but then I always say, after giving you all the facts, you are the one who has to make the decision. I cannot make that decision for you, because at the end of the day, most people want to look for someone to blame. And the only person you can actually blame is yourself. It's so as simple true. as that. So Padre, this is to you. Okay. Have you ever had a tough time counseling a couple or intending couple to like actually consider that your genotype is not compatible. Mm. You have to really like I wouldn't say fall out of love, but yeah. you have to look at the bigger picture and yeah. know that this decision you're making, though you're in love, but it's not the best for your children and even for the next generation. So what's your experience? Have you ever had that very tough time? Um I would say I'm blessed to have never found myself in such a situation okay. where I have to counsel people about that. But um, I always say that when it comes to counseling, what I've learned is that people already have their opinions. They already, many times they've already formed their decision before they even approach you. So what they want to hear is somebody who is going to confirm what they already believe. And that's always difficult. It's very difficult in, in counseling because there's already an obstacle. But what you can do is to let them know the facts. This is the situation. This is, the, this is what the picture is like. If you're making this decision, you have to understand that certain things can come up in the future. But after all is said and done, you pray for them. They expect you to pray for them. Well, thank you, Father. Thank you for the prayer and hope that that prayer will change things. But if you're listening hard enough, you would know that I'm telling you, no, please don't put yourself in that situation. <laughs> Your Father, you have stated that True, even everybody says and knows that prevention, they say, is better, that better yeah. than cure. Yes. And the preventable way for this sickle cell disease is just to make a proper and, and informed decision that, no, I cannot do this. Yeah. I cannot hurt the next generation just yeah. because I'm in love. Of course. And now let's take a break. Let's invite our Know Your Face crew. It's time for the Know Your Face session. Stay with us. On the 5th of January 2023, Pope Benedict XVI was laid to rest. He was the first Pope to be buried by another Pope since 1802, when Pius VII led the ceremony for Pius VI. But this is not the only strange fact you are unaware of about Pope Benedict XVI. Here are some more unknown facts about the illustrious Pope. Number one. He knows how to fly the helicopters, but never learned to drive. Wow. According to Catholic News Agency, Benedict XVI had a pilot's license and liked to fly from the Vatican to the Papal summer residence, Castel Gandolfo, but he does not have a driver's license as he never learned to drive a car. Strange, isn't it? <laughs> Number two. He was a prisoner of war in the World War II. Though his family was strongly against Nazism, the young Joseph Ratzinger was forced to join the German military during World War II. He never saw combat and deserted his post near Munich as American forces were approaching. After a few months in a prisoners of war camp, he was finally released and hitched a ride home on a milk truck. Number three, he knows at least seven languages. He's fluent in German, English, Italian, French, Spanish, and Latin, and has a working knowledge of Portuguese. Wow. Number four, he loves taking care of stray cats. He has long been fond of cats and was known by his neighbors when he was a cardinal to look after strays as Pope. He had two cats as pets, including one he had found in Rome. Number five, he still has two stuffed animals in his mother made for him as a child. He suffered from serious illness as a child, and his mother made him teddy bears. He reportedly has kept them to his death. Number six, he's a skilled pianist. As a pope, he made it a priority 
to make time to regularly play the piano, preferring the works of Mozart and Beethoven. He once said of Mozart's works, his music is by no means just entertainment. It contains the whole tragedy of human existence. Number seven, he had repeatedly asked for permission to retire before becoming Pope. It is common in the church today for clergy to retire at age 75. When he was getting close to that, the then Cardinal Ratzinger repeatedly asked Pope John Paul II for permission to retire from his work as prefect for the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. Cardinal Ratzinger wanted to become a librarian or take some other job that would be slower paced and give him more time to write books. John Paul II refused his request and Cardinal Ratzinger was elected Pope at the age of 78. Number eight, he's only the sixth Pope in history of 266 Popes to resign from the papal office. The last Pope to resign from was Gregory VII in the early 14th century, and it was to help the Western schism. It's anyone's guess if Benedict had it's anyone's guess if Benedict has set a new precedent for future popes to follow. That's it on today's episode of Know Your Faith. Let us know which of these facts is your favorite. Tell us what question you want us to answer next on the show. Until next time, be bold and be Catholic. Welcome back and our discussion is still on genotype and marriage. Just before the break, we established that individuals or intending couples should make an informed decision and they should be very careful because marriage has its own challenges. They should know that before they get into marriage or before they settle down, marriage has its own troubles, has its own storms. So they should not add to their burden. Exactly. Now I would like to know and we would like to know, is there a possible way that genotype can biologically change? Well, <laughs> science first. Let me hear what science has to say. I'm interested in this one. Okay, well, the truth is that um, it is genetically determined. Okay. So based on the family you're from, based on your parents and their own um, genes, because parents transmit genes to the next generation. So basically, it is something that is determined, predetermined, and there's nothing you can do about it. What we say is that there is a law governing nature. Okay. Yeah. What you're asking about is if there can be a miracle. Miracles are not left to us. The miracles that God has given to us is science, the knowledge to know that such a thing exists. And to know that it exists is already a miracle. So you can avoid, avoid putting yourself in a situation. In a situation. Let me use a very practical example. If you knew that as soon as you walk out of your house, yeah. a car will run you over, would you want to make that move? Certainly not. You want to wait and say, wait, oh, whatever, whatever demon, whatever is going to take me away. Let me just wait and let it pass. Yes. So if we know, if we value our lives that much, why would we want to put the lives of the people we, we claim we would want to love and cherish mm. in such a dangerous situation? And that's how serious and how terrible um, um, sickle cell can be to, for somebody. Because you are not the one who's going to feel that pain. True. The person who is feeling that pain is someone who is innocent. Who yeah. would otherwise, if you, the person had a say, would tell you, sorry, please. Yes. Papa, Mama, can you, I know you guys love each other, but can you just do something else with your life yes. and leave me, leave me be. So something like that. What would you advise individuals that have the sickle cell disease? What would you advise them? Those who think that they are not up to the tax, mm -hmm. those who think they cannot perform, those mm -hmm. who think they do not fit in the society, those who feel like their dreams and aspirations cannot be achieved just because they have sickle cell disease? What would be your advice? Well, my advice to them would be, thank God for who you are. God loves you the way you are and he created you for a purpose, and you have some talents that are inborn. So try to find out what your passion is, develop those talents, and be the best you can be. And, okay, well, it's like we're doing motivational speech now. Yes. The truth is that there are a lot of people who have lived and managed sickle cell, yes. okay? And many of them, too, are making informed decisions by saying, I wouldn't want to marry a carrier. 
because I know I'm only just going to expose somebody to the same pains that I myself am challenged by. So if they can be that wise, if you are that wise, it already shows that there's a lot that you have to offer. And of course, it's also their life can also be a reflection to us to say, if these people can do a lot with what they know and with the strength that God has given to them, we also can learn from them and be a little more compassionate. Maybe not for them in terms of feeling pity for them, but let's be more compassionate towards the incoming generation by not burdening them with such a cross or such a burden. Earlier, we said, Dr. You said that the way the society, um, the society's perspective about individuals with sickle cell disease is more like, are you sure you can do it? Are you up to the tax? Are you sure that you, you're suitable? You, you're sure you're okay? You know, people actually pity those with sickle cell disease. Now, how do you think our society can best respond, or would I say, associate or relate with those living with the sickle cell disease? I think there's a thin line between sympathy and empathy. So uh, rather than sympathizing with them and making them feel bad about themselves or making them feel inferior, rather put yourself in their shoes knowing that they need love, they need acceptance, they need encouragement, and encourage them to be the best they can be. Support them in every way possible, and I'm sure they will do well. And from my own part, I had a friend, uh, and typical of me, I don't see the um, descriptions or the tags that people um, have on them when okay. they become friends. This, this young man was a very close friend of mine. Wow. In fact, he was my best friend at the time. And it was only one Hamatan season that I eventually found out. He told me, I can't go out. It's very cold. And when it's cold, I'm usually in my jacket and I just want to stay home. Yeah. And then he now told me, do you know about sickle cell? Um, that somebody's a sickler. I said, I hear it, but I've never seen anybody with it. And he said, I have it. And I'm like, oh, wow, I never knew that. But that's because I've never seen him go through a crisis. Yes. And usually, well, it's when it becomes very, very cold that they suffer multiple crises multiple and crisis. it becomes very, very pronounced. So uh, for me, I, I don't think they are any different from any of us. True. Mm. It's only when we start putting all those commas and marks that we eventually create a boundary or create some kind of obstacle. Yeah. Yeah. So it's important that we see people first as human beings before any other thing, created by God, created in his image and likeness. And in seeing that, we are able to go beyond what we perceive to be their stigma and appreciate them for who they really are. Padre, in matters of faith, Mm. what would be your advice to people who are sickle cell carriers, believing that, yes, when I get married... I'm not going to have any child with the sickle cell disease. I'm trusting God for the best. He's going to do it for me. The plan he has for me are for good and not of evil. You know, people will quote the, tr- the scriptures for you and <laughs> let you know that, no, God has my back. Yes. Now, what would be your advice? I want to thank you very much for this question because I have the first-hand opportunity and for the first time to tell people straight without having to be diplomatic about it. I beg you, I beg you in the name of God, don't do it. It's as simple as that. Please, don't put yourself in a situation, don't throw yourself in the fire and expect God to do what he did for Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Don't do that. Please. Prevention is better than cure. Knowledge is power. You know already. Don't put yourself in harm's way. It's as simple as that. Thank you very much, Padre. Thank you very much, Dr. Adidamola, for sharing your thoughts on this. People, you know now that prevention, they say, is better than cure. Always make an informed decision. Do not be ashamed of whatever it might be. Do not be ashamed of what people will say. Learn to get your facts straight and make the right decision so that you can help the next generation and make our country a better place to be. We have now come to the end of our discussion. Thank you once again, Friar Jay. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you for sharing from your wealth of knowledge. Do not forget to subscribe. Turn on your notification button so you will not miss out on any of our content. Follow us at CFF on TV, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I remain Evelyn Iwoha. Until next time, keep being sent in, in jeans, jeans and shirts. shirts. Bye.